Welcome to KW Conversations, where we discuss the workforce and education issues that matter in the Louisville region. This show is brought to you by Kentuckiana Works, the region's Workforce Development Board. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Kentuckiana Works KW Conversations. My name is Angela Wilson, and I am the Adult Program Director for Kentuckiana Works. Today, we're going to talk about Black women and technology. To have a very thoughtful conversation, we have invited four panelists to join us in this discussion. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introductions. First, we have Dr. Angelique Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the CEO founder of MemSTEM, a company that produces implantable electronics to treat neurological disorders. With a doctorate in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan, her work on microfabricated electrodes arrays have resulted in several national and international patents, funding from the NSF and NIH and a feature on the cover of Hearing Research. Dr. Johnson has delivered a congressional briefing on Capitol Hill and delivered several international talks. Passionate about people as well as entrepreneurship, Dr. Johnson has led numerous outreach programs to promote tech careers to underrepresented minorities and women. One such program involved her traveling to Abu Dhabi to increase opportunities in STEM for Middle Eastern and North African women. Dr. Johnson is also the CEO founder of Visionarium, an organization that promotes, trains, and equips marginalized entrepreneurs. Next, we have Allison Chouze. She is a QA engineer with six years of experience in the software quality assurance field. She came to the tech world from a background in art and in environmental biology. She earned degrees from the University of Louisville where she studied studio art and biology. She spends much of her free time running, knitting, and playing competitive trivia. Now, speaking of competitive trivia, Allison has appeared on America's favorite quiz show, Jeopardy, with her episode airing in February earlier this year. Thank you so much for your time today, Allison. Louisville native Ray Don Long always had a desire to pursue STEM. However, her first career path was in occupational therapy. After a few years, she made a career pivot. When in October of 2018, she began her tech journey by enrolling in Kentucky and Works Code Louisville program. It was a culmination of these experiences that Ray Don had a chance to learn in spaces where other tech professionals look like her. She began meeting future colleagues in the Louisville tech space, resulting in her current position at Louisville Metro Housing Authority as their digital inclusion coordinator. She also serves as the chief technology officer at Funky Pixel Media. Welcome, Ray Don. So speaking of Funky Pixel Media, we had to make sure we included an ally in this conversation so we invited the founder and creative director, Martin Lindsay. Funky Pixel Media is an agency that helps clients tell their stories through customized LinkedIn coaching, social media strategies, custom designed web animations, and uniquely designed websites. Additionally, he is the technology coordinator at Nativity Academy at St. Boniface, where he manages the school IT systems including the iPad instructional fleet for students and the school social media strategy. Martin is an advisory board member for the Ghana Code Club, a youth coding program in Accra, in Accra, Ghana. He is a former teacher of animation and social media marketing at Bellarmine University. Welcome to everybody today. So what we're gonna do is just jump right into the conversation, but let's start off with some, some statistics. Nationally, women make up about 25% of the tech workforce and black workers make up 8%. Here locally in our Kentuckiana region, those figures are about 28% of women in tech and 6% of black workers. But most relevant to our discussion today, 
is that Black women only make up 3% of the tech workforce, both nationally and locally. Knowing that there are not many African-Americans, let alone African-American women in this sector, what was it that got you interested in a career in IT? I came from a background of, I've always been interested in science growing up, um, specifically biology. Um, so I've always been good with computers, but it really wasn't something that was on my radar growing up. Um, in college, my undergraduate degree was actually in photography because I also like art and photography is kind of the most scientific art. <laughs> um, so you're in there with chemicals and working with light and optics. Um, and then at, eventually I went to grad school for biology. While I was finishing up grad school during a recession, I found myself working in a call center. Um, and I soon got pulled off the phones to help work on a special project where we were correcting uh, like hundreds of thousands of customer accounts. And because I had the ability to work really quickly and accurately, I was actually one of uh, the employees that was charged with um, checking the work of other people. So without even knowing it, I was sort of doing quality assurance even in the call center setting. And then um, as I spent some time there, I was identified as a person who would help actually explicitly test the software when they had new releases just to make sure that it would work for the agents on the phone. Um, and so after doing that for a while, I had a friend that was working for um, a, a, a company doing, doing QA work. She thought I'd be good for it. Um, it would be something I'd be good at. So she managed to get me an interview. And at this point, I didn't really have much of a, I didn't have a coding background at all. Um, before the interview, I learned a little bit of SQL query language, uh, just so I could write a basic SQL query. And they were really looking for someone that wouldn't be scared of code, that ha had the ability to kind of think analytically and solve problems. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, to get the offer. Um, and since then, I've built on my skills. I've gone through a few sessions of Code Louisville, which has been wonderful um, to kind of help build my coding, coding skills. And now I'm a QA engineer, so I'm actually writing a lot more code as part of my job. So um, technology, it's not anything I have ever, ever really studied formally, um, but I just sort of naturally grew into it based on my other interests. I would have to say my interest in tech um, began, well, I've always had a, a interest in a STEM career, as you stated, um, but coming from the medical sector, um, we always were updating software, had to document um, on our patients, um, and doing that, I was always the person, the go-to person to help people um, with um, using their technology. And um, I, again, I didn't realize that I would be in a tech career, you know, um, years later, but um, what piqued my interest more, um, as you stated, Angelia, was the fact that the there was a misrepresentation excuse me, uh, underserved population of people of color um, in that industry. And I thought to myself that um, me liking to help people um, and technology, again, I'm, even in my family, I'm normally the go-to person. Hey, can you fix my phone? <laughs> hey, can you do this? <laughs> can you do that? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess, you know, but um, long story short, that's uh, how I was able to get here. So. Yeah, for me, I, I grew up as a creative and sciencey kid. Uh, PBS was my favorite channel. My mother was a school teacher, so I had very little choice but to like, you know, educational TV. Uh, she didn't like much else. So, so some of my early heroes were the science heroes of my childhood. I, I watched all of Jacques Cousteau's oceanography specials. Um, the uh, I think it's Jane Goodall who who studied the the uh, the um, primates in in uh, Uganda, I believe it was, and you know all, all of those folks. You know, in high school it was Carl Sagan who had the the, co the first Cosmos special. So all all of that stuff was was you know my natural wheel wheelhouse as a kid. So uh, unfortunately, the school system I grew up in didn't have a science curriculum until I went to high school, but fortunate enough to go to the, the math and science high school in my hometown I'm from St. Louis. And that grew, groomed me for engineering, uh, which was my very first career 
uh, what bought, which originally brought me to Louisville the first time years ago. Uh, so skill wise, always loved like engineering skill set. It still serves me uh, in everything I've done ever since then and the years since I've left the profession. But I never liked the career of engineering the corporate world. So uh, I share some perspective on, on that perhaps uh, on how some things are fit for some people and not for everybody. And somehow, sometimes you have to pivot in life. For, for me, the best pivot has been creating uh, my own company and building uh, my team over the last couple of years and with some degree of intention and learning how to be an executive uh, in my own right, uh, as opposed to working for others. So it has been said that race and tech tends not to be overt, but more systematic. Can you speak to how you have experienced or observed any systematic racism? I would definitely agree with that. Um, I, it's, I, don't, I can't really think of any examples where the racism that I've experienced in tech has been overt at all. Um, uh, it's just the kind of, the thing that gets to me sometimes is just the grind of not seeing anyone who looks like me and I will say there are a handful of other black women in my company. Um, so it's, 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 it's a growing company. It's our department. I would say there's got to be at least 100 people in the technology department. Um, and I mean, I can count the other black women on less than one hand. So it's just um, and I can't say because of the pandemic, there have been hires and there have been a couple companies that we've acquired in recent months. So I can't say that for certain. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I'm, hope, I'm hoping yeah. there's more of us at this point. Um, but, you know, it, it does, it, it's, it does get to you sometimes. Um, and I know it's, it's definitely affected me. It's just, it's just kind of isolating. It, people can be friendly and you can have friends at work and people are kind, but it's just, it's, there's still that thing that you're always faced with. And um, it's just, it can be very isolating sometimes. So I think that's probably the hardest thing that I have to deal with from an on, um, just um, in the workplace. And for me, one of the, that's one of the particular reasons that I, I really didn't enjoy corporate life. And for, for me, the perspective was having gone to a, a black college. I got my, my degree at Tuskegee in Alabama. So, you know, I was in class with dozens of other people who look just like me. So I mean, despite the statistics that say there are not a lot of us in the country, there are, a, there are still very many of us to be sourced from. Um, I, everywhere I worked, even when I was a college intern, I was typically the, the only black college student in, in the workforce in any department I was in. I was likely to be the only black person. I can think of both the corporations that I, I work for. Typically, there might be one other uh, black person, both of those places. I, I remember them very well, two of my favorite coworkers, one at each, uh, was a black woman at each of those companies. Uh, but you would, you would, it, it always felt like the boxes were checked once those slots were filled, but you know, whitewash everywhere else. And to today, even I, I hear the same story years later in the local corporate community, uh, doesn't seem to me, I'm not in the corporate community in, anymore, but to hear other people speak about it, doesn't seem that the trend in this city uh, has advanced very much in comparison to other places. Still bad all over the country as far as I'm concerned, but particularly, I'll just go ahead and say backwards in Louisville. Um, I would have to say for me, I have not experienced it um, hands on because um, Louisville Metro Housing Authority is more diverse. In fact, um, most of my team um, were the minority, <laughs> well, the majority, excuse me, and um, our cat, our our non-melanated brothers and sisters are, um, you know, they're more the minority. However, um, I'm gonna. I'm not trying to jump the gun, but when it came to job seeking, uh, transitioning from a medical field to the technology field, um, I was under the impression that, you know, hey, I'm going to get my coding certificates, tech certifications, and I'm going to find a tech job. 
Um, but it took literally from August until February to find a job. And I'm like, but there's tons of jobs out here. I would interview. Um, and again, the interviews with most of them were all white males. Um, so I don't know if that was, and I know for me, that was a bit intimidating. Also considering I didn't have as much experience as most corporations are looking for. Um, however, that's the point of getting your certification and finding a job so you can gain um, experience. So um, those are kind of some of the barriers that I ran into um, when it came to that. So if you would have known prior to starting your tech career about some of the challenges and prejudice you would face, would that knowledge have helped you cope with it along your journey, along the way? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, having, even if I would have had, um, again, more people that look like me that could, like you said, coach me or educate me or um, even just when I'm finding out too, Angelia, it's also who you know, networking. If you know someone, <laughs> it, it just takes a phone call, you know? So if yeah. I would have um, known more people that look like me, maybe um, it would have made me at least a little more comfortable, so. I'd say absolutely that that would have served me better uh, as a as a young adult coming right out of college. I, I I heard people speak about networking and relationship building, but you know I came from a, a home and a culture that that emphasized you know individual skill and individual excellence. So that was always foremost in my in my head. I kind of like just disregarded all the other stuff. So for me, if I had taken uh, early advice on networking and relationship building uh, more more seriously and more thoughtfully, uh, I probably would have advanced a lot further early on in life. But on the other hand, uh, my my entire objective was to leave the corporate world and start my own thing anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> later in life, I just got more intentional about it. Uh, you know. Don and I are a perfect example of that. We, it seems like everybody on here so far has at least done Code Louisville. So, you know, Don and, and Allison and I have that in common. Uh, Don and I also were in Tech Louisville, uh, one phase behind each other. Uh, the way we met each other, interestingly, is that program coordinator, uh, Robert Moore, turns out wanted to, uh, to introduce us to each other. He thought we, we might ha have something in common on, on our, our technical experience and between classes we met each other so we've got to beat him to the punch but he facilitated that because uh, he knows the value of networking and whatnot and, and I kind of got nosy in a conversation that 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 she was having with another student I, I heard him say talking about networking and the way you get into the market is to go to the different meetups and you know that's how you get your name out there and you can like make your resume a formality if they really like you They'll, they'll, they'll bring you on. So I, I kind of got news. I was like, okay, who, who, who's this lady over here talking about my favorite subject? And so that, that turned into a conversation between us and uh, our bringing her on as our chief technology officer. So we're, we're an example of, of the value of that in the entrepreneurial space, you know, when, when we're working together after our day jobs. I would say it's a little bit of yes and a little bit of no, because you can't really be prepared for racism and um, and biases against you. There's no way to prepare for that, for the shock of that, even if you know it's going to come and, and, um, and happen. Um, however, if you know that it's going to come, you can um, essentially know how to navigate a little bit better. So I think a lot of the younger generation, they're, they're growing up in a more awake <laughs> um, era than, yeah. than we did. But because social media is so woke, but when you get to the workforce, it's still not there. And so they don't know how to um, navigate it, maybe for better or for worse, that their way of addressing is a lot different. Um, but I think it's, you can't be prepared for it, but you can certainly get some mentoring on how to advance through it. So it sounds like for better or worse, um, each of you are finding ways to cope. So let's talk a little bit about ways that you are thriving. Knowing that we are constantly looking to be the best versions of ourselves, 
what is next for you? Like what's, um, what's a, a next professional milestone? Um, well, for me, I was um, recently promoted to QA engineer. So I'm doing a lot more actually writing code to test our product, which um, so I, my objective for the near term is just to continue growing my technical skills. Um, I feel like I've built up a lot of knowledge of, you know, I've been with my company for six years now. So I have a lot, I have a lot of knowledge of our products to the point where, you know, when we hire new people, they come to me for, for answers to the questions because I know it inside and out, which is a really nice, I, I like having that level of expertise, but I also kind of want to build that technically and continue to do that. Um, so for me, that's, that's my, my goal for the next uh, year or so, I guess. Yeah, for me, I, I've been at Nativity for three months and going through the through Tech Mobile uh, was a, an eye opener for me to realize that I liked IT way more than traditional software. So it was a, a great late but great transition from the world of traditional engineering uh, to technology. What we do uh, is perfectly uh, fit for a situation where you're forced into a remote life because what I do is remote software service uh, for our, our middle school students to be able to uh, do their remote education uh, at home, uh, which we're forced to do now. Uh, it's the same for our teachers uh, with their MacBooks. So I manage uh, a MacBook fleet and an iPad fleet, uh, service as a software where they're learning by uh, apps that are, are pushed to their devices, manage updates and all those sorts of things. So, so I'm my objective is to be stronger on the two platforms that uh, I use uh, to be more adept and, and, and uh, develop my expertise, ideally even to travel and speak on them nationally, maybe internationally over the next year or two. Um, I would have to say for me, it would be uh, to finish my master's degree in information technology. Um, <clears throat> and on the here at Louisville Metro Housing Authority as digital inclusion coordinator, um, working with the community is nonstop. Um, so if uh, my goal is to um, get as many people connected um, and also get as many people to like learn how to utilize their technology, right? Because they can have the internet, have a cell phone, a computer, but don't know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So that's my goal, is to teach more people the importance of technology. Part of my role has turned out to also be digital inclusion because part of uh, having young students is having parents and grandparents who are their guardians during the day, or maybe not if they're latchkey kids. So it's, I, I do uh, a, a lot of training of parents and, and other guardians to help their students at home from time to time. Or if the kids have a problem with, it, with an app or an out of date device, so, you know, I may be doing a, a screen share or a Zoom uh, with, with the adult and the kid, uh, seeing what's going on with their device. So I, I'm doing a lot of digital inclusion work uh, by default in my position as well. So. That's one of those things, another one of those things where Dawn and I are sharing notes yeah. on many cases. What is a big, bold idea that will increase opportunity for more women who look like you to be successful in tech? Mm -hmm. If you had no restrictions, what, what's a big, bold idea? One thing I would like to see, and I've kind of been pitching this everywhere I can pitch it, and um, <laughs> Ducky Anna Works does a really great job um, of, of providing internships to individuals that maybe in some cases otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to work with a tech company. So I think that people should be leveraging uh, that, expanding that program. And particularly if there's black women that come out of the undergraduate degree program mm -hmm. and um, they maybe are not quite ready yet for corporate and you know they say hey i want to get some mentoring so i can learn how to navigate in a non-inclusive environment or i can learn how to navigate as a black woman coming into the corporate sphere and being one of one and having opportunities for those individuals to 
basically come and work an internship or work an extended, um, almost like a post-bac program in our area. So work for a year with a company like Memstem or another Black-led tech startup so that they can not only learn um, and have mentorship on how to navigate it, but also they can learn how to create their own because I, that's another area that, that we are um, underrepresented in. And so it would be great to have that kind of mentoring and, and development in a, what I call a safe environment. Because a lot of times you come out of college and you go to the primarily white corporation and you're so just trying to, to survive, you don't get an opportunity to thrive in the tech and learn new tech skills. So we've noticed with a lot of our interns that have come through Kentuckiana Works, um, other programs that we work with with the state, that uh, one of the biggest benefits is just for the women to foster and grow without the pressures of any biases that they may experience or microaggressions. And they're so much uh, more readily able to expand their technology skill set as well as their professional soft skill set in that environment. Are there other resources um, for our listeners to learn and gather more information? Um, I know in particular, Ray Down um, listens to a particular podcast that might be beneficial <laughs> for our um, listeners to learn about. Yes. Uh, so I listen to the Karen Hunter show, Sirius XM, um, Urban Views, Station 126. Um, and Karen is pretty uh, well versed um, and she's diverse, <laughs> but she's all about for, you know, helping the people grow. Um, so on Tuesdays, she does a segment called Tech Tuesdays, where there are um, African-American or just any people of color um, uh, tech entrepreneurs or um, people who actually work at tech companies, but they're just giving, they're having conversations like we are now. Um, you're hearing about a little bit of everything from sexism, racism, um, also other opportunities as well, which is kind of how um, I got into the tech space as well. I kept hearing, I'm like, wow, these dudes are making this much money just to play a game or code a game, what? I'm like, oh man, yeah, I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, would have to say, Angelia, as well, um, I learned recently about Girls Who Code, um, where they are teaching young ladies um, how to code. And I was supposed we were supposed to actually do a program uh, this past summer, but unfortunately, COVID came. Um, so we're still trying to figure out a way to go about doing that with the young ladies um, virtually. So we'll see how that goes. I don't have a specific resource, but I will say more in general, um, just um, there are a lot of really good follows and on like black tech Twitter. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of great people out there. Um, one that comes to mind, I said I didn't have specific names, but I do Angie Jones. She's a QA automation test engineer. I follow her feed. Um, there, there's people out there. We, there might not be a whole lot in Louisville, but broaden your network, look outside of it. There are a lot of great examples out there. Yeah, when I, when I think of, of groups and people, uh, one of the first that's related to what all of us do, uh, user interface and user experience, uh, Black UX Labs uh, is a, an organization and, and a Facebook like page as well. Um, and it's created by Amber. Amber's last name is escaping me at the moment, but she's a Louisville native and she's created this platform that has just taken off. Uh, so, you know, I, I recently joined us to make that a, a resource for us on the creativity, on the visual end to elevate our design game. Uh, so, you know, that, that's one great tool for great resource for networking. Um, locally, Louisville Black Creatives is a, a, a really informal, not an organization, but a, a, a collective of artists of all backgrounds. I would encourage anyone interested to apply because creative and technology intersect directly when it, when it comes to web design and, and app design and even uh, proprietary software, the, 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 the world of the arts. The, the, in other words, the, the Allison Cougets are needed everywhere. That, that, that academic background in the arts directly uh, works with uh, the, the software world. So you know, coding and visuals basically is the same world, just a, a, a different, different flavor of, of the same sauce, basically. 
uh, a couple of others, uh, creatives of color collectives. So, so for, for me, when I'm curating my, my, my social media feeds, it, it's more from the creative ends, uh, a little less so on the, on the, the tech end, because uh, that feeds my, my creative curiosity from, from my digital arts background. Um, the, the big idea for me is one that I practice on my own because I can appreciate, uh, like I say, being the only black person in the office or being the only black man and, and seeing a black woman across the room. And, you know, so from, from that, my, my natural networks kind of like reflected here. I, I'm intentional if for no other reason than my organic network has a lot of black women in it. Uh, but I've done that on purpose, you know, a few years ago when Angelique was doing some of her uh, early entrepreneurial things. That's how I got to know, know her. I went to one of her workshops and met lo lots of people in the, in the uh, entrepreneurial and startup scene. She was kind of one of my intros into that world locally. Uh, and you've heard what, what, how Don and I have gotten to meet. So for, for me, it's intentional having seen, you know, that, that, you know, marginalization up close. I've been intentional myself. I, I think personally, if more black men were intentional about including black women in what they do, we could accelerate uh, the, the growth of, of all of us in these spaces. Thank you to everyone that's listening. This has been another great episode of KW Conversations. And until next time, talk with you soon. Thanks for tuning in to KW Conversations. Visit KentuckianaWorks.org to find labor market data, resources for job seekers and employers, and much more.